Uh, thanks, uh, Susie. Uh, it would be fair to say that uh, much of what I'm going to say, you've probably all heard before. And I just suppose my issue is I don't feel I've still got a great solution to end of life care management. So I'm really like Walter looking for some uh, ideas and imagination. So I'm trying to try and set the scene. I, I think many of you will be familiar with the scene, but just to remind you, uh, and to some degree focusing on acute hospitals, which of course may not be the right place to focus in terms of dying, uh, but it is where many, many of us will die in the end. And looking at whether we are able to recognize dying, whether we're actually having conversations and how we appreciate those conversations or not. And then sort of, outline the current state and uh, what we might need to do to change. Well, whether you like it or not, you may, if you want to decide to die at home, you're very unlikely to die at home. Uh, most of us will die in acute hospital, and that's even when we get to be frail in our elder years. And it's interesting, when I did a, a, a review of all the 29 aged care facilities in the Australian Capital Territory as part of the COVID response, at least 90% of the residents had some sort of goals of care form stating their wishes uh, or advanced care plans. And yet you still see many of those aged care residents dying in hospital. Now, whether that's right or wrong, I'm just suggesting that you haven't quite got it right, but uh, we are likely to die in hospital. So that's why I guess my focus then becomes hospital because so many of us will actually die in hospital. Now, as Di has pointed out, the Australian um, Commission in, in Safety Quality in Healthcare is looking at healthcare systems across the country. And one item that they've also focused on, not only communication, but also is end of life care. And there's a consensus statement that came out in about 2014, sort of outlining the 10 components that we should consider and conduct in uh, the acute care system of which there are 10 elements. And one of them is looking at recognizing dying so that if we recognize it, then we should have the conversation. And the conversation should be uh, compassionate. People should have knowledge about how to have the conversation uh, and have sensitivity and have skills to allow a good conversation in a very trying environment. So that's what we're supposed to do. And that's, this has been out since 2014. But dot, 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 what does that actually look like? So subsequent to that consensus statement, uh, a number of us got together around the country to have a little look at that, what's actually happening about our dying. Now I say what's actually happening. This is only from the perspective of the healthcare professionals. And I think a huge gap in our data, and I know Di's team working with, we're trying to get also the uh, perception from families and the patient who is dying. It's very difficult at the moment to, to actually gather those data. So as I say, across the country, we tried to get representation of what dying looks like in our acute care hospitals. And, and these are the states and territories that are represented. And there are some gaps. But if we look at dying in hospitals, not surprisingly, uh, we are more likely to be old. Uh, and I put Canberra because we did a pilot study on this uh, data collection tool uh, and then the other nine hospitals. Reassuringly, Canberra is very similar to the rest of the country. Less reassuringly, we're just as bad as everyone else. Uh, it, again, interesting, I was curious that more men are dying in hospital than women. So where are the women dying? Don't know. Uh, maybe it is in the aged care facilities. Uh, again, I don't have those data. Uh, I think the other thing to note is you see that um, uh, most are coming from home. There are obviously some that are coming from an aged care facility, which kind of goes against what the uh, data I showed at the beginning. And then the other issue for us is that uh, you often have more than uh, one hospital admission in that last 12 months. So again, suggesting that this is not a new uh, experience in terms of you know, someone uh, in a frail state having repeated admissions to hospital. And at what stage is someone gonna have the conversation to allow these patients to actually die rather than keep intervening with the sort of acute uh, issue at task? The other thing to note that in hospital, uh, you're very likely at least 30 to 40% have had an experience in the intensive care unit prior to death. 
So that's again, a sort of an interesting thing that's happening is that we're bringing people into intensive care and, and in spite of intensive care, we're still dying. So again, is that really an appropriate admission to the intensive care unit? So if we look at recognition of dying, because of course, if you don't recognize that someone's dying, then you're not gonna have the conversation. If we look at the data, you can see at the top, very few of us have advanced care plans. And that's in spite of millions of dollars being poured into advanced care planning and uh, you know, advertising and trying to encourage people to think about what they want in their dying day. So only 12% of us who die in hospital will have thought about what's gonna be best for me when I die. So I guess it's a little note to self, if you don't have a documented plan, at least talk to someone and they often say, if you have a daughter, they're the best people because they're more objective. Sons tend to apparently be less objective. They're much more, I don't want my mother to die. Um, I just don't know what that says either. <laughs> but at least have a conversation with someone so that, uh, you know, when we come to you, because by, unfortunately by that stage, most of you will be unconscious or not able to have the conversations. So we're going to be talking to your surrogate, uh, help them understand what it is that you would like. That said, most people in hospital will have some sort of goals of care form at the time of death. So at least uh, we've thought about it. But again, if you look at the time from that form being filled in to when you die, it's just under two days. Now, I'm, I guess I'd suggest to you that most patients dying in hospital are not unexpected. So if it's not unexpected, why is it taking until the last two days to have some sort of conversation to help us understand what it is that you want. The other thing to note uh, is that palliative care is seriously under-resourced. I'm sure Michael can talk to this. Uh, and only 40% of us will have a palliative care consult, whether it be nursing or medical, prior to our death. Now, one of the, I guess, the ways in where palliative care works is that it also says that only wants to be involved in complex cases. Um, and I guess it's not the patients that see palliative care that I'm worried about. I'm worried about the 60% that do not see palliative care. So what kind of care are they getting prior to their death, particularly in hospital? And again, the time that takes from referring a patient to palliative care to dying, again, is a very short period of time. So even if you were to get palliative care, it's a very short time period. And I, again, I've been a strong um, supporter of palliative care because it allows you to have your journey be cared for uh, through your dying process, and not only you, but your families and your carers. And I think, if, again, if it's only two days, it's very short. And just to reinforce the challenges that uh, if you don't have a plan uh, and you're in hospital, at least uh, two thirds of us will have some sort of intervention uh, in the 48 hours prior to death. And again, all those interventions will have been of no value because you died. We also asked the healthcare professionals across the country what they thought their di the dying experience was like for the patients. Again, I, I really emphasize here, this is about the healthcare professional and their views. The missing piece here is clearly uh, the carer and the patient. And so we've got uh, you know, uh, nearly two and a half thousand healthcare professionals across the country in terms of views. And you see, obviously the largest proportion of will be nursing. So we talked about training. So if you look at training, and I guess I'm not sure what training really means. We asked them, do you know, did you receive any training in recognizing dying? Uh, yeah, not a lot. So less than a half are getting any sort of training in uh, how to recognize dying. Now the challenge will be is, well, what does dying actually mean? Is it the last two days? Is it the last six months? Um, and obviously your conversations might slightly differ depending on where in that time frame you're sitting. But whatever, not many of us are actually being educated how to recognize dying. So if you can't recognize it, then you're not gonna even start to have the conversation. However, if you ask the healthcare professional, do you feel confident about recognizing dying? There you go, 96% of consultants, they can recognize dying. Uh, not super confident, of course. And then uh, you've got junior doctors, a little less at 80%. Nurses still, and I suspect if, if anything, the nurses are probably best at recognizing dying, 92%. 
because they're there many more times than say, particularly the senior doctor and then allied health, less confident and maybe actually, you know, does mirror uh, their ability. Uh, I, I, in some respects, I was quite surprised by the next question. Yeah, my consultants are skilled at recognizing. So we asked the junior doctor, do you think they're skilled? 80%, 85% said yes. Uh, nurses, not so confident about their consultant recognizing dying. Um, and then if you ask the, uh, do you think your junior doctors are good at recognizing dying? You can see that uh, the nurses think only 37% are any good at recognizing dying. And the consultants uh, thinks that half of them are good at recognizing dying. So I'd, I'd suggest you've actually got a problem uh, in recognizing dying uh, uh, at the, in the first instance. So we haven't even got to the point of having uh, to know when to have the conversation. And I just put the education a bit at the, uh, underneath how confident I feel. So again, you know, it doesn't really seem to reflect whether you've received training or not in your ability you think that you have in terms of recognizing dying. So then we also asked, you know, do you think end of life care has done a well on my ward? Um, now at the a Hospital, we, we want to deliver exceptional care. I'd say therefore we have to have 100% saying that we do end of life care well. Uh, well, across Australia, we probably only have about mm, half, two thirds saying it's done well. Well, I'd suggest to you that that is a problem. And then uh, do we think they have timely withdrawal of, I guess, acute intervention? And again, the nurses are suggesting that we don't. Uh, and again, I would probably reach out to them and saying, you know, what is the truth? Um, and the consultants think, yeah, well, you know, seven, nearly 75% of the time we're getting it right. Um, do we think consultants make timely decisions? And yet again, the nurses are suggesting, mm -mm. Uh, oh, but the consultants think they're doing fine. 94% we're doing fine. Um, the junior doctor is a little less comfortable um, and along with allied health. So that's the recognizing. I'd suggest that you know, we probably have an issue with recognizing and we don't train very much. Uh, we might think we're good at recognizing, but let's go back to the nurses. 37%, mm -mm, not good. So do we educate people about end of life care conversations? Now, my challenge always with this education is that you can educate someone, you can have a one-off training, or you can have two lots of training or three lots of training as a medical student or as a nursing student, and then you disappear off into the ether into the healthcare system. And it's really probably that is the challenge is, you know, do you have appropriate support when you go off into the, into the healthcare system? So you can see that only 33% of the nurses had any education of how to have a conversation. Uh, I was just surprised that so many consultants had had some sort of education, but that may just reflect how, you know, uh, that, that maybe they're just junior consultants that had gone to great medical schools and had lots of education. Uh, but um, more junior doctors had received. <laughs> No, 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 that's, it's all good, it's all good. Um, and only uh, less than two thirds of junior doctors had had some conversation, uh, training and conversations. Um, however, do I feel uh, confident in my ability? Look again, the consultants, 97% saying that, all good. Um, junior doctors, 75%, uh, if they feel confident in talking to families. Do we think that the consultants are skilled? Look at the allied health people, they definitely don't think they're skilled mm -hmm. at having these conversations. Uh, and again, look at the JMOs. Uh, again, you know, certainly not perfect about talking about death and dying. And I guess I just highlighted those that have had education versus how skilled they think they are. And again, they don't seem to match up. And I guess you've got to ask the question, why don't they match up? Why is education not necessarily influencing how good they are or how good they feel? So my challenge is, and this is where you know, I want to fix end of life care. I rang up you know, the senior medical advisor at the Commonwealth said, you know, Andrew, we have to fix end of life care. He said, it's very complex and difficult. <laughs> yep, that certainly is. Because you know, it crosses lots of jurisdictions, uh, all sorts of funding issues. Anyway, getting back to where I think the challenges are. Education, recognizing dying is happening, but it's patchy. I'm not sure what's being taught because, you know, are we just talking about the last two days? We're talking about the last six months. There are lots of progno prognosis tools out there for heart failure, liver failure, respiratory failure, and yet we probably don't bring them into the conversation and say, what is dying? 
And the challenge, of course, is that it is the consultant who, if you like, owns the patient. Again, I, you know, I don't like that concept of owning the patient, uh, who really makes the decision to you know, take away the acute intervention and move to a, a more comfort care palliative approach. The trouble is, and I'm now obviously talking out of school, is that consultants are predominantly in working hours only. So if that's the case, that only a third of the week are your patients seeing or having contact, and that's being generous uh, with the consultant. So then they're not there all the time to make the, the, the decisions. And indeed, our data showed that only 30% of patients will have a decision made by their home team. That just reflects how often the home team are there. Uh, and therefore, what happens is that the decisions are made often in a rush and often out of hours. And often that means you won't have someone very skilled at having the conversation. So are we also having our education about end of life care conversations? Uh, yes. But patchy, if you go to Geelong, then you'll definitely get education. But if you go somewhere else, you might not get education. And what's being taught? And as I said to you, there is no strong relationship between education, confidence, and perceived skill of the individual. Uh, and so is it that that conversation is really, yes, education, but yes, but what about experience? You need to have some experience to be skilled at, a, at, at certain skill sets. Uh, and also the structure of the conversation. What's the structure that you're approaching the patients and the families with, if at all? So I guess I you know, just put some things out there as a potential for changes. I do think, given that um, you know, it's really at the aged care sector that we probably should at least start to focus on, and I'm aware that you know, there was obviously conversations with the children later on, it's just the vast majority of people who are dying are older. So should we get something like the blue book? You know, I don't know how many are familiar, but you know, if you have a child, you get given the blue book and there's milestones in that blue book. And as one of the aged care specialists here, Marianne Cool, she said, well, what about the purple book? Let's have the purple book for the aged care. And in that have milestones. And in that you have a trigger for the conversation. We should probably make it mandatory to have training, whether in medical schools, nursing schools, a bit like, and then have it akin to basic life support in hospitals. We're all accredited around the world, around the, the uh, country, and therefore have to have basic life support checked off as a must. Maybe you should put that in as a conversation. And the other thing is, you would never send a, an intern, a resident, or a registrar in to do an appendicectomy on their own. Why is it that we do send in our juniors completely unsupervised? to have those conversations and not seeing it as really critical to the patient's experience and the family experience. And yeah, you need to maybe get it signed off that you've done enough uh, in, in a, an appropriate way. And as I say, maybe, maybe I should just accept that not all of us are good at communicating. And maybe we should sort of start to construct having very skilled communicators in the hospital such that we could draw upon them to have these very challenging conversations. And maybe they could be mentors as well for our juniors. Um, and certainly, you know, in other disciplines, we've started outsource some of our work. You know, the medical emergency team looks after tearing patient. Do organ donation conversations are looked after by the donor coordinators. So, you know, is that something that we should move to really train up these highly qualified, highly experienced communicators so that this experience is not probably as awful as it seems to be. So just a very quick summary is that I think end of life care is complicated and it's certainly not easy for patients, families and healthcare professionals. Um, I don't think there's a magic, one magic bullet that's gonna fix everything. And if you look about handover, it's not just about the training, it's about the system that you put it into. Um, but I do think as a community, we should really start to say, you know, this is not acceptable and we need to change the way things are happening. Uh, and not leave it to those last two days when, A, you cannot be part of that decision making because you're too unconscious. Um, and let's sort of move up the conversations to when you're actually fit and healthy and start to think about what it is that you want and so you can have a meaningful conversation when the times sort of start to come. But as I say, it's very hard to give what you want if you don't have a plan in place. Uh, of course, all this work that I've done is not uh, just me, it's loads of people around the country. Uh, and uh, thank you. <laughs>